Our tennis channel inside in is joined now uh, an esteemed broadcaster, a coach, a tennis professional himself. I'm going to get a little winded reading all these accolades, but somebody I grew up listening to and, uh, you know, now currently the president of the International Tennis Hall of Fame. And I should also point out, coach the Davis Cup, the United States men's team to their title in 2007. Patrick Macro joining the show. Patrick, honored to talk to you. This should be fun. A lot going on in your world. So uh, thanks again for joining the podcast. Uh, I appreciate you having me, Mitch. It's great to be on with you. Thanks. Yeah, there's a lot of different places. I didn't want to make you sound too old saying I grew up listening to you talk, but we, we kind of had well, to. You so you, you, you accomplished that, okay? So I am feel I just had surgery on my left shoulder a couple of weeks ago, um, which is not my, I play with the two-handed backhand, but uh, I had surgery on my right one way back in the day and the same doctor dr david alchek who's one of the most esteemed um shoulder specialists amongst other things he did my left shoulder so uh, a little sore but after three weeks i'm pretty happy with the progress but to your point yes mitch i'm getting older but aren't we all yeah oh that, that's true and, and i will say i wasn't even planning to start there but tennis players and and i don't think and maybe you can expand on this people understand because it's not what we would call physical sport in terms of physical contact with the opponent. But, you know, you players that have played for decades and, you know, wear a lot of this wear and tear in your body and what it takes to not only make it on the tour, but to make it as a successful pro, you're living proof of proof of it as well, that there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot that, you know, you're going to unfortunately have to deal with going forward. Yeah. There's a lot of wear and tear. It's not, as you said, of the, of the violent persuasion, like in football or some other uh, contact sports, but, you know, the especially now, I mean, I'm I'm just amazed, Mitch, at what these players uh, nowadays are doing on the court. You know, the the movement, the explosive change of direction, um, you know, the time of play, obviously, is similar to what it was when, when I was playing, you know, the long matches and so on. But just the speed of each point is just remarkable now. So, you know, the players have adjusted over time. Uh, you see a lot more off the court work being done with the with the top players. Um, getting their, their bodies ready for the wear and tear, you know, flexibility, mobility, that seems to be even yeah. more important now than it's ever been. So, but I, I just marvel at what these, these modern players are able to do. Um, and, uh, you know, and as we're seeing nowadays, do it for a extended period of time, you know, these players playing, I mean, we know the all time greats are doing it, but there's a lot of players that are, you know, top hundred players. I was watching last night on tennis channel, Fognini, you know, he's, I think he's 37, 38 now, um, you know, was a top 10 player and he's still out there, you know, playing at a pretty high level. I mean, he's dropped down obviously a bit in the rankings, but you still see a lot of players that are able to maintain their careers for a long time, which I think is great for the sport. Do you think that is like a rising tide lifting all boats where they're seeing other old players and maybe in not just your era, but eras before where there wasn't? These old guards, it was so rare to see a player 35, 36 playing. Obviously, Djokovic is the standard, but I do think it helps to see a lot of your peers and contemporaries still going and gives you that motivation to stay out there. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, obviously, a lot of players, you go, you know, think of Ken Rosewall getting to the U.S. Open final at 40, you know, when he played an upstart named Jimmy Connors. So players were doing it. And then in my era, you know, in the 80s into the 90s, players, you, you you sort of felt like at 30, that was kind of the time when you, you almost retired. I mean, even greats like Becker and Edberg, you know, my brother was, was in his prime in his mid twenties, Borg retired very young. Connor sort of was, was very unusual in his day that he was able to play into his late thirties at 40. Agassi had a bit of a run as well, you know, in the thirties, but, but definitely this past era, Mitch, with, with Roger, Serena, you know, Venus is, you know, God bless her, still out there playing. Obviously, Rafa, Novak. Um, but as I said, even even other players like Fognini, like Wawrinka has come back off of surgery. So I think it's great. And to answer your question, absolutely. I mean, the players are, you know, seeing what other players are doing. They're taking care of themselves a lot better. Those that can afford to have full teams around them, obviously, are able to do that. And that helps in um, with the longevity that we're seeing from some of these all-time greats. 
Yeah, it certainly is remarkable to see. You know, they just keep moving the goalposts and, and redefining what it is to be great and everything that they've gotten, they've deserved, and they've earned. Uh, getting back to your tennis journey, and I know it starts with that famous Port Washington Tennis Academy that produced your brother, produced other great players. How much of your falling in love with the sport and then going at it competitively on the professional level was following in your brother's footsteps and how much of it was just falling in love with the sport on your own? Because that's the part I don't think a lot of us, myself included, really know about your individual story. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's a little combination of both because, you know, obviously as the youngest of three boys, um, I did really whatever my brothers did. I have another brother, Mark, who is a good tennis player, didn't make it a profession. So whatever my brothers did, whether it was playing stick ball, playing stoop ball, you know, going down to the field and playing basketball, or playing tennis, you know, that's what that's what I wanted to do. I always had uh, a special affinity for tennis, mostly probably Mitch, because I just happened to be pretty good at it. You know, I, I love sports. I love playing soccer. I played soccer and basketball, uh, baseball, you know, through school. I even played soccer all the way through high school, which my brother did as well. Um, but tennis was something that I liked the individual nature of it as, as much yeah. as I love team sports. Um, you know, the idea of being out there on your own. I mean, I have great memories of hitting against the wall at the Douglaston Club. I and mean, that's how I learned how to play where we grew up in, in Queens, New York, which was sort of a precursor to me even going to the Port Washington Tennis Academy. So between that and going to Port as a kid and participating in the groups and just being around tennis, um, that that was really number one. It was it was it, and, and in fact, as I got older and my brother became famous, it, it was actually more of a challenge being John's brother, you know, because he was so famous and because I wasn't, you know, quite as good as him, although I got to be a pro, which as I'm learning in my years now at our tennis academy, that in and of itself is a um, is hugely difficult to accomplish. So uh, yeah. but over the years, as I was growing up, I had to like kind of look myself in the mirror a lot and say, you know, why am I doing this? Because I had to deal with a lot of crap you know, being John's younger brother. Um, but at the end of the day, it was because I love the game. I love the sport. And um, I was pretty good at it. And I know you want to do like most people want to do if they have older brothers, what they're doing and want to be around them and in the same activities. You know, I know you get asked a lot about what it was like with, with John, but what was it like seeing your brother, just the older brother you looked up to becoming this megastar, like just watching him transcend into something uber famous and you know, redefining what tennis really was in this country. Yeah, I got to say it was, um, you know, initially when it happened, which I sort of go back to that semifinal run he had at Wimbledon when he was a teenager. You know, he came out of the qualies. He was just over there to play the juniors. Next thing you know, he's playing Connors on center court um, at Wimbledon in the, in the semifinal. And, uh, you know, from that point on, it, it was sort of just became normal for us. I mean, it was unusual initially to have – you know, I remember reporters coming to our house and, you know, when John would come back from Wimbledon or winning the U.S. Open, they would put stuff on our lawn, you know, our, our neighbors and so on, congratulating them. But from it really became almost normal, which is weird because it, it uh, you know, I was so young when he first so I was 10, you know, 10, 11 around the time when he made that Wimbledon breakthrough. And so I have a lot of memories of playing junior tennis from that point on where everywhere I went, even when I was a highly ranked junior player, which I was throughout much of my career, you know, I'd go to different cities and there, you know, here's John McEnroe's brother, even though I was, you know, seated number three in the nationals. So I, so I got used to that part of it at a pretty young age. And I think our whole family did, um, did as well. From a tennis side. And I know you guys had similar styles. No one really plays like your brother, John, obviously. Yeah, no, but but what, what did you take from him and what, kind of did you work on to really make your own game and, and kind of not rebel, but just put your own spin on how you play the game? Yeah. I mean, I think we both had very good uh, hand eye coordination. I mean, he obviously is a whole nother level, but that was, that was one of my strengths, which was sort of seeing the ball, taking it early. Uh, you know, the return of serve was, was definitely my strength in my game. My back, my two handed backhand was my best shot, uh, <laughs> but I didn't have the speed that he had. I didn't have the serve that he had. So I was a little bit more of a baseline player, counter puncher. Um, I couldn't I couldn't get to the net because I just wasn't quick enough and I didn't have a good enough serve to serve in Bali with any consistency. So I sort of found my way um, playing more of a, 
I guess calling it an aggressive baseline game when I could. As I said, I was a little bit more of a counter puncher. So I, what I could take from him, I did, which was, you know, good hand, seeing the ball early. But as you noted in, in, in your question, nobody plays like him. So it was hard to really – I never really tried to emulate his game. But our coach that we had when we were growing up, Tony Palafox, who we met at the Port Washington Tennis Academy when we were both quite young, he ended up leaving there, as did we, um, relatively uh, early in our junior careers – um, was was also known for having great hands and taking the ball early. So he used to teach me that, especially on the return of serve, which was, um, you know, definitely the strength of my game. You know, and you carved out your own career. You went to Stanford, a couple team titles there, and then, you know, going to the Pro Tour, winning a title and singles, a, a bunch in doubles. I'm always asking this question to pros that have their, their big runs. Australia in 91, the semi-run. Was there anything different or was there anything that stood out along the way that gave you a sign as someone that played tennis every day that this feels this feels a little special, like something's happening here? Well, it never happened again. I made the quarters of the U.S. Open a few years later, but, you know, that ended up being my, my best singles run. Although, as you said, I had a couple other good singles results. You know, the quarterfinals at the Open was big for me because it was in my hometown. But I do remember in the first round, Mitch, I was actually down two sets to love against guy named Thomas Hogstead, who went on to become Sharapova's coach and an excellent coach in addition to being a solid player. And I was down two sets and I was down a break in the third. And when I came back and won that match, mostly because of fitness, it was a brutally hot day. And and he just, you know, basically ran out of gas, you know, early in the fourth set. But when I won that match, you know, I've been doing a lot of off-court stuff. I've been working on my fitness and I realized that, you know, especially in best of five, that that could pay off for me. As I said, it wasn't, you know, I didn't have the <clears throat> most naturally powerful game or explosive game. But I, I was in some ways I was better in longer matches because I was pretty fit. And I think that helped me when I won that first round match. I was like, wow, I can win a match like that in a big tournament. And that sort of propelled me through the rest of the tournament and took advantage of a good draw. But, um, uh, you know, I actually had a chance against Becker in that semifinals and I think the kiss of death, Mitch, was when I was up. I was up a set in the semis against Becker, and and he was serving. I'm going to say two, three, something like that, in in the in the in the second set, and I had break point. And I thought to myself, man, I said, you know, if I could get this, I, I could actually be in the finals of the Australian Open. And that's when the wheels fell off. You know, as soon as I started thinking about that, you know, he turned it up. He ended up winning the tournament, and you know, beat me in four. But. Um, uh, that was certainly a run where it, it was nice because I was one of the last players to actually get in the main draw. My ranking was outside the top 100 going into that Australian Open. So ironically, sort of my best result ever in a major was when I was sort of at my lowest ranking coming into the major. Is that something, is that story something you tell kids that you work with now or players you work with now that stay in the moment because something like that could be the kiss of death? Well, I, you know, I call it, well, that and also preparing to, to be successful. So I felt that it was, it was a combination of both. You know, I prepared, I'd done the work. So when the opportunity came, I took advantage. You know, if I hadn't have been super fit, if I hadn't have been doing that, you know, I could have easily lost in the first round or maybe not recovered for the second round. And then at the same time, you know, when, when, when you do have let a, an opportunity slip away, to know, to don't let it slip away because of what you just mentioned. You know, I don't think that was the reason I lost a match, but, um, you know, Becker was pretty darn good at the time and he was just better than me. But I do think that that's something that for kids to just kind of be where you are, um, play point to point as much as you can. And uh, don't try not to think about the bigger picture of what's going on. You know, as your tennis career was winding down, I know you officially retired in 98, but you started to do commentary before that, CBS, other networks, you were, you know, staying involved. Was that something in the back of your mind that you were determined or at least passionate about staying involved in the game? Or did that kind of organically happen where here you are, you know, you've been retired for over 25 years now and you're still very much involved with tennis. What was that process like for you? You know, I, I got lucky that I got an opportunity as I was coming back from a couple of shoulder surgeries, still trying to play, though I wasn't able to really be successful sort of from mid-96 until, as you said, 90. Even I even started doing some stuff with ESPN, 96, 97. Um, but I did always want to be in television. I used to love um, watching 
you know, the U S open with Tony Schraebert and Pat Summerall and nuke. And, you know, I used to, I used to watch that. I used to love football, watching football and Dick Vitale was someone I looked up to, I become friendly with over the years, who's a big tennis fan, by the way. So there were, but, but did I ever think like it was definitely going to happen? It wasn't like I, I didn't go to broadcasting school or journalism school, but when I got the opportunity, uh, partly because of my name, you know, no doubt, um, I took advantage of it and, uh, I loved it. You know, I loved doing it right from the start. I think I was pretty, pretty natural at it right away. Um, obviously, I've worked on it over the years. So, but there were times when I thought to myself, should I get into something else? Mm. You know, I considered going to a graduate school, I actually applied and got into Columbia um, Graduate School for Business um, and, and was seriously considering doing that. And then I got named the Davis Cup captain. So that really was what I really, you know, that was a dream of mine to become the Davis Cup captain. The TV certainly helped me get um, that attention. My name certainly helped. So yeah. all these things gave me opportunities to stay in the game. And when I saw that I could do that and make a living, I was like, well, I think I'll stay in the game. So it's it's worked out pretty well. I've been able to do the, the commentary um, work for the USTA, you know, now it, with my brother at our academy in New York, which I love doing. So I've been extremely lucky to be able to do a lot of different things. And now, of course, be the president of the International Tennis Hall of Fame is another, you know, great honor to be participating in that and trying to help them, um, you know, get to the next level. Yeah, and then of course it seems like the years just fly by. It feels like yesterday, probably, that you were just thinking, "What should I do?" Is TV here? And then it's been a couple of decades, and here you are, just a tennis lifer. And you mentioned, and I agree, you have a lot of you know natural ability to just fit into the, the sport of tennis and calling it on the microphone. But I know that other people in that same scenario have to and acknowledge it was a lot of work. There was a lot of stuff I had to learn, and knowing a lot about tennis, and you know, does not necessarily translate to television. What were some of the not challenges, but I guess things you had to learn to hone skill wise. Well, definitely the, you know, when I first started at CBS, I did a lot in the studio. So I'd have to learn about the cameras and who, do, you know, when to look at the camera, when to look at your co-host or whoever's with you. So there are a lot of, you know, just kind of minor things about um, television production that I had to learn. But again, I love, I love the game. Uh, I, I think the fact that I, being John's brother when I was a kid, I mean, I'm still John's brother as a grown man, but, you know, getting asked a lot of questions, I was sort of used to being the guy that, you know, the reporters would come to and talk to a junior tournament. So I became quite comfortable in that uh, world. What I really worked on was being the host myself, you know, then, and that was, you know, why I tried to do play by play as much as I could early on. I did my own radio show for ESPN. That was an all sports show that I do on the weekends now doing the podcast, which I've done for the last four years. I always tried to kind of improve myself, improve, improve my skill set just by doing things that sort of pushed me out of my comfort zone, hosting in the studio. I've done some of that over the years, even in the last you know couple of years, I've done more, even some political stuff on CNN and other networks. So that's really pushed me to, you know, get better, to learn about other topics, to, to, to learn how to deal in other um, realms of television. And I really have enjoyed it. I think I've done pretty well with it, but uh, always looking to try to improve. And it's gotta be a dream, right? To call a match with your brother. Like just thinking about the two of you in, the, in a booth together it has to be just a little wild thinking about all the memories. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's pretty cool to think that, um, you know, I still pinch myself when we're in the in, in, in Wimbledon Center Court at the US Open or, or, or Australia call in the finals. And that was definitely one of the reasons, Mitch, when I was at ESPN, I was sort of the main uh, color guy. And I could see, well, that probably at some point my brother's going to come over here and he's going to sort of take my spot <laughs> or at least be part of the team. So yeah. uh, to be able to learn how to do the play by play and, you know, sometimes it's just being him. Sometimes obviously we're with Chris Fowler doing yeah. the three in the booth. So I think I've been able to manage whatever's in front of me. Um, as far as television goes. And I think that's why I've been able to stay yeah. employed for this long. <laughs> One of the reasons why. For sure. More with Patrick Macro here on Tennis Channel Insight. And I did want to touch on the Davis Cup, your playing career, but also coaching that team to the title. Whenever I hear yourself or your brother speak about the Davis Cup, it's pretty clear how patriotic and how important it is to be a part of that and be a part of representing your country in any iteration. Was that just ingrained in your DNA from your family growing up? 
Definitely. I mean, uh, we were, as I said, you know, we played a lot of sports, so we were always very committed to uh, team sports whenever it was. And there was just something about uh, representing your country that was different. I think our parents being relatively new to the country, you know, that both their sets of parents came over from uh, Ireland or England um, in, 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 you know, the last 50, 75 years. So I think there was a real certain sense of pride from both our parents about being American um, and representing the country. So that was, yes, that was something that was definitely drilled in that that was something to be very prideful of and to you know sort of answer the call if it ever came. Obviously for my brother, it came quite a bit, you know, as a player, I was lucky enough to play four times. And then certainly as a captain, um, you know, I served for 10 years, which was definitely the biggest honor of my professional career. So I loved it. I love representing the U.S., being part of a team again, because it gave it gave it gave us that team part of tennis, which you miss, you yeah. know, being you know on the professional tour. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love the team events, even the new ones that have come up with the last couple of years, the Labor Cup, which I've been lucky enough to be involved with. But um, putting on the red, white, and blue, and representing the U.S. for all those years with with a great group of players was was a huge honor. Yeah, that team camaraderie that you don't normally have. You can tell tennis players just are, are latching on as many opportunities as they get. And uh, it, it is an interesting role, right, being a captain where you're you're coaching on the now there's coaching in tennis, but you're coaching in the match and there's, you know, you don't want to deal too you know drastically with players. But what was your strategy like when you were a captain in some of these big matches, dealing with the players like Roddick, like Blake, like Marty Fish? What was your strategy as a captain? It really depended on the player, Mitch, and you're 100% right. I mean, you know, especially being the Davis Cup captain, I didn't spend that many weeks a year with him. I tried to keep in touch with him over the course of the year, of the season. I, I made a real effort to try to keep in touch with their coaches so I knew kind of what they were working on. But I would say for the most part, Mitch, less is more. I mean, these are professionals. These guys are at the top of the game. They're used to being out there on their own. So um, you could get yourself into more trouble if you say something stupid, which Roddick would remind me of many times. You know, he, I, he'd say, yeah, that was the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Uh, you know, the Bryan brothers are a little bit different. They, you know, especially Mike, the right-hander, you know, he liked to, you to talk to him, you know, just remind him of very basic things. James Blake was, was different in that he kind of had his, his, his game plan. Roddick was actually a little more analytical about what was going on, um, it, you know, during the match. So you really have to pay attention, like, because he, he could kind of call you on it. Um, you know, Marty was a little more happy-go-lucky. So everybody was a little bit different. But I learned this, Mitch, years ago from my, my great college coach, Dick Gould at Stanford, when I spent my four years there. And he said, when I became the captain or when I was about to become the captain, I called him for advice. And he said, you know, in tennis, because it's an individual sport, the one thing I learned over the years was to treat everybody fairly, but not necessarily the same. Right. And I thought that was great advice because, you know, if it was Andy Roddick coming in, having just, you know, won a big tournament, you know, you pretty much let him do what he's going to do as far as practice goes and how much he wants to practice. If it's a young and up and coming guy, you know, you're going to say, listen, you're going to practice for four hours. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to do this. So it really depended on the individual and particularly when he got into the match, which is when it's on the line, you know, that's where you can, you can say something that might really help, or you could say something that might really hurt. And you don't, as a captain, you, that, that's not the place you want to be. No, no, it's a fine line and it's a lot harder than it looks. I think we can all see from the outside, but again, you know, props for that team winning in 07. We'll see if they can, you know, get another win down the road with uh, all the talent that they've had. But, you know, that's just kind of a, you know, a segue into a bigger topic, Patrick, is that obviously you love to coach and develop players, not just these pros, but young players. What is it about that process and what is your favorite part of teaching the game to somebody young that has a love of tennis and is just looking to you to get better at it? Yeah, well, I've learned a lot being at our, our academy here in New York. You know, when I was with the USTA, my job was a little more administrative, more political. Um, I wasn't really on the court as much as I probably would have liked. Um, but here I get to do that a little bit more. I just came from our group from uh, our kids that are mostly homeschooled that come early in the day. And then we have our groups after school. It's really about passion, Mitch, you know, trying to learn, you know, skills, obviously, along the way. But I think it really has to come from the kid that they're passionate about the game. 
They understand there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. You know, tennis is a tough sport. You mentioned physically, but I think psychologically more than maybe almost any other sport because you are on your own. Uh, you make a lot of mistakes. You lose a lot of matches. Um, even if you're really good, you know, that happens. So I think it's finding the person that understands that's part of the process. That doesn't mean you don't get pissed off and you don't get frustrated, but you kind of enable are able to see the bigger picture, which is what can I do today to just get a little bit better, to just improve my game a little bit more. And if you do that, to me, you're a success, you know, because most of the uh, skills are genetic that you have in tennis that, you know, that determine whether you're going to be a pro or not. So I really look at the kids individually to say, you know, do they want to be here? Do they want to get better? And if they want to do that, then I'm all, all for trying to help. No, that's very, that's very insightful wording. And, uh, you know, it's the only sport without a shot clock, without a game clock that you can just run out to. So you have to finish it off. And as you, and as you said, I was talking to Paul Anacone last week and he said players at the top even have to learn when they first come on tour how to lose and how to process losses because, as you just said, only one tournament winner. So a lot there. Uh, and, and it segues into the other thing you're doing, the Hall of Fame role. You just got announced the president. So, again, congrats to that. Thanks. Starting this year strong uh, as the president of the International Tennis Hall of Fame in Newport, Rhode Island. How did that role come to be and what intrigued you about being the person at the helm for this prestigious place. Well, they were looking for someone to take over from Todd Martin, who had a great run there as the CEO, and um, Dan Faber, who ended up taking the job as the CEO, as someone I know really well through his job at the USTA. And it, it, we were both sort of interviewing for the CEO job, and it became obvious that the two of us together, I think, would make a great team. Because if I had just been the CEO, there's a lot of things that I wouldn't have been able to do. I think Dan is so well equipped for that particular role. And for me as the president, it's a way for me to, um, you know, work with him, work with the Hall of Fame, which obviously I have so much respect for, for the players there, for the history there, for um, being the place where, you know, we celebrate the history of the game and the players themselves. But to me, more like the history of of, of the sport itself. And uh, I love that about the, what the Hall of Fame represents. So I think I can hopefully bring something to the table to help awareness, to help inspire people that being part of the Hall of Fame, you know, very few professional players can even dream of being a Hall of Famer, right? Yeah. Um, so imagine for the average person. So I think this idea that we want to inspire people to sort of find your own greatness and whatever that is in life. Um, to me, that's that's a great part of what I think the Hall of Fame can do. Um, not just in this country, but globally, because tennis is such a global game. And I look that as I look at that as a big part of my role in trying to help um, spread the message of what the Hall of Fame represents, obviously here in the U.S. Uh, and in the tennis world, but also globally throughout the rest of the world as well. It's always important to understand your history, even passionate tennis fans now that maybe discover the sport for obvious reasons in the last 10, 15 years, they're used to some iconic players, but it's good to remind them there were icons and eras before that they can learn up about, read, and uh, pay attention to. And you also had a quote in your announcement, too, that I thought was interesting. You know, you want to share and promote the fun side of the sport. Yeah. So if you could expand on that, just the ideas to kind of, you know, do that at the Hall of Fame role and make you know, the fun side of tennis more in the mainframe. Well, one of the things that I've seen at, at my tennis, at our tennis academy here in New York, is that there's so many kids, adults, that just play, who have are not going to be hall of fame tennis players right but they love the game they love the sport and i think part of what the hall of fame um should do is is spread that message that tennis is a great i mean i see it in the you know the leagues the the 3.5 4.0 leagues that come to play and the um the group clinics that we have at our academy you know people really love the game and are passionate about it and and believe it or not many people at that level are even more passionate about trying to get better than professional players. So that to me is really inspiring. Even I've given lessons to kids that have no chance of ever playing even college tennis and, yeah. but they love the sport and they love, and they want to learn something. And I, and, and I think that's um, a great thing about our sport is that you can, whatever level you're at, if you're really into it and you enjoy mm -hmm. it, um, you can get so much out of it and it can teach you so much about, life, you know, um, handling, 
disappointment in your life, you know, trying to focus on something to, you know, help you get better at something that maybe you're not genetically equipped to do that well, um, like professional players are. So in some ways I, I, I have in, in many instances, more respect for people like that, that really want to learn and have fun with the sport. And I think that's something that um, we at the hall of fame can do a lot to promote that. Yeah, that's, that's powerful stuff. Progress in life is always key. You always want to be working towards something and give yourself some fulfillment there. So tennis being so popular and so passionate, it's, it's great to see. And I'm, I'm excited to see how you guys continue to grow the game and continue to move forward. And we know, you know, I want to wrap with some of the stuff going on in the current game. The game's in pretty good hands. What we saw, well, first with Novak Djokovic at age 36, I mean, there's not much more. I mean, I've been waxing poetically all year, Patrick, for what he's done career-wise just shattering the record books, but him at 36, like you were talking about this before, what that age used to mean for tennis. Now it seems like in ways he's widening his, his gap, his dominance with the field. It, it really is incredible. I mean, I remember sitting there you know, reminiscing um, as we were talking earlier with my brother at, at the Wimbledon final after the match ended and we were sort of setting up the rest of the year. And I sort of said offhandedly, you know, I feel like this is going to motivate Djokovic even more, you know, moving forward. And I, I wouldn't have predicted that he'd go 18 and 0, you know, since Wimbledon final uh, and win three huge titles, including the U S open. Um, and not the, to me, the amazing thing, Mitch is, is not his, his total domination is obviously incredible, but it's also like how many matches he's winning that are pretty close. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like he's, you know, some matches he dominates, but, you know, like you go to Paris, which he just won and, you know, Rublev played the match of his life and it went the distance. And, you know, somehow, you know, Novak can steamroll you, obviously, but he can also, you know, has this ability to just play the big points better than anyone and just win the close matches as well. Which yeah. Normally, as you get older, that becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, yeah. But normal is not the word we're going to use with him because it, it it's just it really is incredible what he's continuing to do. And I think it's the motivation that's the most incredible. I was actually talking to one of our coaches here at our Academy who's Serbian. And we, you know, he, we always talk about Novak and I said, it was right after he just won Paris. And I said, wow, you know, he did it again. He goes, he goes, it's amazing. He says for him, it's, he's, he's never satisfied. You know, he's never sat. He's, he's always, he's, he's so hungry to keep mm -hmm. going uh, after all he's done. Um, so let's enjoy it because it's pretty incredible. Uh, there's obviously, so as, you, as you intimated, great young talent on the rise um, that are right there. Um, and we've got some great young talent in the U.S., which I'm very excited about. I hope, I hope one of those guys can, one or two can step up and, and win a major or be in a major final. But there's certainly a lot of great stories to look forward to as we look to the year-end championships and then, of course, the beginning of next year in 2024. He's such a chameleon out there evolving, playing how he needs to, doing what he needs to to win. And the close matches thing is such a perfect analysis because it seems like there's always like a 15-minute window where it's like, all right, you might have him. He's on the ropes, but you got you to gotta finish it and go for the kill shot here because he'll find a way out of it and he'll figure it out. It's just really remarkable. Uh, the fact that Alcaraz has stepped up to kind of maybe push in, in this generational battle, it's funny because when we were when I was prepping for this interview, I thought about a match that was on ESPN that you called. I distinctly remember Nadal Agassi when Nadal, when Nadal was right. an 18-year-old kid in Canada. Up in Canada. And your, your, your commentary was kind of like before the match became a classic. Like this is a seismic generational battle. Like these moments don't come, come along that much where the young kid coming up is facing the wily veteran. And that might be enough to keep Djokovic motivated knowing that these young guys in Alcaraz's case are coming for the throne and are a real threat this time. Yeah, normally over the years, you know, when a young player sort of beat one of the all-time greats, it, it really was a change into the guard. I mean, you go, I remember my brother getting beat by Courier. I remember, you know, as you said, Nadal and Agassi and, you know, even Federer beating Sampras that year at Wimbledon. It's it's almost like you, you kind of feel it's, it's like an inevitability about it, that it, it's here, it's here and it's picking up steam. And yet with Djokovic, you know, he's had not just a loss to Alcaraz, but he's had other, you know, losses, whereas it's to Rafa at the French or so on. And somehow he just comes back, you know, mm -hmm. like he doesn't like he doesn't 
you know, he came back stronger after losing that Wimbledon final, um, which is amazing, which shows you again <clears throat> how difficult it is to do. Even the struggles for Alcaraz since that Wimbledon final, you know, show you that the guy's human. It's not as easy as it looks. People just assume, oh, yeah, he's going to be number one. He's going to win every tournament. Not that easy yeah. to do. And somehow Novak still um, is doing it as consistently as ever. He's not playing as much as he used to competitively. But, boy, when he does play, he's ready to go. And you mentioned those Americans that are coming up as well. We have four now in the top 15. It's been, you know, the unfortunate stat 20 years since the last major champion going on 21. But for the first time in recent memory, it does feel like that streak could be coming to an end. The four players there, Ben Shelton, obviously a lot to like about his game. Sebastian Cord is not even in the top 15, but a young player to watch. Are you finally seeing maybe the tides turn that there's not only the depth of American men's tennis, but some real potential for some slam winners on the men's side? Well, I think we've seen the depth coming for the last few years. So that was always our goal at the USTA. I mean, it's, it's hard to have a goal of, you know, finding the next Serena Williams, right, or the next Pete Sampras. That, that's really not an achievable goal. But I think what was an achievable goal was just sort of having strength by numbers, which I'm glad to see um, the U.S. has been able to do, you know, particularly uh, on the men's side. Women, we've always had it. And we've also had, you know, some top top all time greats as well. On the men's side, it's been more difficult to find those players that we think have a chance to actually win a major. And so, you know, um, you've got those four guys, you know, the more veteran of the of the guys with Tiafo, with Fritz, uh, with Tommy Paul, who stepped it up the last couple of years. Opelka, I hope, can come back and be a factor, you know, after his long injuries. He's a great young kid, too. But I think the, the, the two guys you mentioned may be the two guys that have the best chance to actually win one. Um, mm. In Corda, who's got the best all-around game of any, any of those players. And Shelton, who's got sort of the most explosive game, you know, with the serve, the forehand, just the sheer athleticism. Um, if his, I call, you know, with someone like him, I say he's got the most intangibles. Once, yeah. he, once he has the most tangibles with the basic bread and butter tennis, I think he can win a major. You know, I think he's that good. He's that explosive. Um, mm -hmm. And I think Corda, if he can just get a little bit stronger, a little bit more physical in the way he plays, particularly off the serve, um, I love his all-court game and his ability to play, you know, any style. Um, but it's nice to see we've got a great group. And those other guys are just solid as rocks. I just don't know if they've got enough to actually win a major. I think Tiafo, Fritz, Paul, they can be knocking on the door. But I feel like they need some help. Whereas with the other two guys, I feel like they could just burst through and just, you know, be that good. Yeah, Shelton has that it factor, right? Like you can't even maybe describe what that is, but you watch him and you see, okay, this guy's got something special. But yeah, the tangibles and the tangibles were getting there. The, the, the streak after the U.S. Open, very impressive that not only did he coast to the end of the year, that he kept getting better. Uh, wrapping up here with Patrick Macro, it's been a blast talking to you here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Want to close with this. Uh, you're going to what, Tanzania in December with your brother? Uh, going yeah, down in we're looking forward to that trip where I got to recover my shoulder so I can hit some of my two-handed backhands out there in the Serengeti. But it's going to be an awesome trip to spread, uh, you know, the, the, the good vibes of tennis in some place that, you know, quite frankly, has probably never seen it. So hopefully we'll see a lot of kids. It's also going to be just a five-star trip and ability to, you know, go to that part of the world, which I've never been to. So looking forward to it. It's going to be a great group. And um, hopefully we'll get some good photos of us hitting some balls with um, who knows who'll be in the background yeah. there, Mitch. You going to get out on the court with John? Is that yeah. a competitive thing still? Well, you know, um, this particular one, I don't know how competitive it will be, but we're going to have some fun. We're going to do some clinics. We're going to play with some of the guests. Uh, but the answer normally is when we play here at the Academy and no one's watching, of course, it's competitive. He's still out there. He plays with the kids actually in the program a lot, which is great for him and great for the kids. And um, he can still hit that ball pretty darn well. I don't doubt that. Yeah. Uh, and it sounds like based on the, the entire interview here, which has uh, been a treat that uh, you're still as enthused about, you know, being in the game, being involved in tennis and still as passionate about the sport you, you fell in love with as a kid. Very lucky, very grateful, uh, very happy to still be around it um, pretty much all the time. So uh, I'm counting my blessings, Mitch, and hopefully I got a, f a good few more years to go.
All right. Well, last thing, why should people come out to Newport, check out the Hall of Fame? What's the hidden gem there, the the man at the top's well, reason well, for well, coming Well, I mean, the museum is amazing. So if you ever get the, you know, I mean, Newport's a great town. It's a great city. There's a lot of history there. Um, the museum, which, by the way, is going to undergo a renovation the early part of 2024. So hopefully by the spring, it'll be brand spanking new. It's just so much history. The grass courts are in great shape. I got to hit on them this past year during the tournament. Um, so there's just so much to see there. There's so much awesome history um, and appreciation for what, you know, sort of how the game started in this country and, and also all over the world. And uh, hopefully great things to come up there as well. Can't wait to see it. Patrick Macro, you can check him out on the uh, Holding Court podcast. He's running the Tennis Hall of Fame. He's also teaching with his brother, his brother's academy as well. Uh, Patrick, this was a blast. Thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate it. And uh, best of luck with all those endeavors you got going in the tennis world. Thanks for coming Great on the stuff, show. Mitch. Appreciate you having me on the show. Good job. <laughs>